Hello, Matanistas. Before we get going, I have to say something about the vlog. The quality of the in-match footage is appalling. I'm very sorry about that. It was caused by a lot of people joining their friends in the area where I was filming. I don't blame them for it. It's what happens sometimes and it'll happen again. But when the offside goal was scored and the goal, I was jostled horribly and just about hung on to my camera and my footage was of basically the sky and the floor. So I hope you enjoy the vlog, some great food beforehand and of course the usual post-match pint. Afternoon, Muttonistas. Yes, it's another Cockney Odyssey, as you can see. Highbury and Islington Station at the back, but we're not here for a football game against Arsenal today. We're here with 9,000 City fans to see if we can break our horrendous record at the new Tottenham Stadium. So join me, hopefully, on a glorious day to watch City break that hoodoo and beat Tottenham in the FA Cup. Let's hit it and join me for the vlog. So Matanistas, you might wonder why am I near Highbury and Islington? It's because my friend Athena has brought me for what's going to be a very interesting lunch. Haven't brought you a comprehensive food segment for quite a while on my football vlogs, but today we are going to go to somewhere called Prawn on the Lawn for seafood, possibly with the odd beverage. Right, Matanistas, I know oysters do divide opinion. I know some of you love them, some of you hate them. I happen to love them. And as you know, anything that's raw from the seafood or the meat department, I'm right in there. We've got a mixture of Colchester, Carlingford and Jersey here. Now, the Carlingford I seem to remember were the ones out of those three that I really like, but they look all fresh and tasty. But as always, we'd better give them a quick taste. So we have three types of dressing here, just natural with lemon, which is a very nice way to have them. Lime actually works as well, even though the sort of normal thing is to have lemon. And we've also got some shallots and vinegar and Tabasco. Although I always say you can have a great time trying out oysters with all sorts of hot sauces. So wow, that was meaty on its own just with a squeeze of lemon. I think that might have been one of the Carlingford ones because the Jersey ones are a bit smaller. But whatever it was, Mutton Easters, we've got to have a quick slurp after that. Okay, a Jersey oyster now with a little bit of shallot in vinegar. Now, when it comes to cutting oysters, if it's done well, the oyster should be loose from the bottom of the shell. There should be still a bit of the salty liquid inside, and most importantly, all bits of shell must be removed so that you don't get a mouthful of shell. Okay, and finally with a bit of Tabasco. I think this is one of the Colchester oysters because of the deep shell. I think oysters can go well with all sorts of hot sauces or just on their own, according to your taste. But one thing I am sure about, and I know a lot of you will say, oh, Mutton, why aren't you having Guinness with these oysters? I much prefer white wine or champagne or a little cheeky beverage that I'm going to show you with my next couple of oysters. Okay, I give you, first of all, a Thai spiced Bloody Mary. This 
is the sort of stuff that should go well with oysters, although there are some offending articles in here. Those of you who follow me a lot will know full well that I do not like celery, so let's get the celery removal squad in. And then a manzanilla sherry from Andalusia in Spain. The second driest type, and one, if you watch my Spanish videos, you'll see me harping on about all the time. In fact, at some restaurants, I just have sherry and don't bother with wine. And I'll give this a quick slurp first, because I think it's the right order to take things in. Yeah, that's classically dry, slightly floral, everything you'd want in a manzanilla. In fact, I think these oysters are so fresh and tasty and meaty. I'm not going to have any sauce with them from now on. I'm just going to have them natural. And Mantanon Mutanistas, the Thai spice Bloody Mary. Oh, that's nice. I think this will go beautifully with the oysters. In fact, reinforces the need to eat them naturally without sauce. There's a little bit of a kick, not a huge one, and I suspect that will suit most of you. That's a nice match. Anyway, I'll get on with the oysters, and then it'll be time for the main courses with, of course, a different beverage. Now then, for the mains we've gone for six small plates to share. Sharing is always fun. And the first one that's come, of course, is the cold one, ceviche. Peruvian-style marinated fish, and here they've gone for trout. The fish should be raw before the marination, so I hope that's the case here. Trout being a slightly unusual fish to prepare ceviche with, but salmon is used often enough, I suppose. We do have a bit of sherry left, so we'd better take a quick slurp to cleanse the palate. Okay. Marinated to the right point, so it's not overwhelmed. In fact, it's a very light and simple dressing. Not quite as spicy as I'd like it to be, but the fish is marinated to the right point. So you can still taste the rawness and the freshness of the actual base product. And since there's a bit of the Thai spiced Bloody Mary left, would be rude not to try it with the ceviche, wouldn't it? Because I think it won't go well with the rest of the dishes we've ordered. Okay, let's do a bit of quality control as always. Mm. Yeah, it's actually a good match. It actually provides the spice that I think is missing from the ceviche. Anyway, Matanistas, before the mains start coming thick and fast, a little bit about the wine, or a little bit of knowledge, rather, about the wine. Gruner Weltleiter, an Austrian white wine, and it often comes served slightly effervescent. Don't worry about that. I've lost count of the number of people who have said we need to send this back. It's a bit effervescent. A bit like, say, Vino Verde from Portugal. And the wine gave off secondary flavours of apple, peach and citrus. Athena and I definitely got the apple and peach, a great accompaniment to seafood. In fact, the closest wine to it is probably Sauvignon Blanc, but if you like, shall we say, less of the mineral flinty flavour you get, particularly in old world Sauvignon Blancs, this is the one for you. Now, next up, crab som tum. Som tum is papaya salad, very popular in Southeast Asia, and it can be blisteringly spicy over there. I doubt that's going to be the case here. I think they're emphasising on the flavour of the crab, but only one way to find out, because it should be a little bit spicy. Obviously time for a quick slurp.
tiny bit of crab shell in my mouth there, which I bit on, so that's not great, but it wasn't that big a piece. And I'd say it's quite salty, actually. Crab itself is fantastic, so I guess the way they've done it emphasises the flavour of the crab. I would just like it to be a bit more spicy, but if you see this in a Thai restaurant, it's a great starter or something for people to share. It's the immature papaya, I think it's green papaya, with a little bit of shredded carrot, sometimes some shredded peppers and other things, and always a bit of fish sauce and some sort of citrus to help ramp up the heat. Even I, Matanistas, can't have the hottest ones in Thailand, but I do like it hot. Right, Matanistas, we're ramping up the pace here. The food's coming thick and fast. And when I walked in, this was the dish that I was really looking forward to try. Actually, one of the cheaper dishes on the menu. It's called barbecued jerk fish collar. So that's a Jamaican preparation. I'm actually not sure which fish is being used. Anyway, we have a Glasgow salad as you saw to accompany it. And some sprouting purple broccoli with XO sauce. Now, I'm going to try the broccoli first because this is a good bellwether to me of how well they can cook because that should be fresh, hard, al dente and not the sort of soggy meat and two veg creation that you see at, shall we say, hotels that think they're fancy but are not actually very good in the kitchen. No, that's good. That's good. They haven't overcooked it. I'm pleased to see that. Now, my friend Athena is from Hong Kong. She says the EXO sauce is not as good as she's used to there, but I quite liked it. And I guess, as is the case with everything here, anything spicy does get a bit toned down so that the taste of the fish or the vegetable comes through. Anyway, on to the jerk fish. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yes. That has got a bit of spice to it. For me, the best dish so far. And again, the fish is cooked to the right point. Don't overcook your fish. Send back overcooked fish. If the fish is cooked correctly, enjoy it and take a quick slurp. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with jerk seasoning or jerk dressings, it's Jamaican, it's Caribbean, so it therefore has to be spicy. Got a bit of a slightly sweet tinge to it because it, it's obviously based on a barbecue sauce as well as jerk sauce. But look at that, haven't they cooked that beautifully, Matanisa? Just look at the hint of redness still in the fish. And when you cook fish, you just want to stop cooking as soon as the fish turns opaque. And here they've done it well. A bit of blood on the fish is never a bad thing either. That is almost as good as Kevin De Bruyne's passing. Not as good, because nothing could be. Okay, not the most exciting bit, but we'll quality control the Glasgow salad. Oh, that's very, very pleasant. It's like roasted potatoes that are then deep fried, if that makes any sense. And the outside does have a bit of spice to it. And therefore, mutton easters, we'd better have a slur. So, shows how much we know, we were told that the fish with the jerk marinade was cod. It was so meaty, so fleshy, and so far away from fish and chips that you wouldn't believe it. So, what a great way of cooking cod. Okay, scallop time. Thai style scallops. Looks like it's in like a green curry dressing. Indeed it is. It's beautiful, really beautiful. A little spicy, not very, but I'm loving it. And again, quality of the scallop, as they say in Spain, estupendo.
Anyway, Metalistas, on we go. Penultimate dish here, skate wing, which is one of my favourites, in a pumpkin and squash curry. Don't know again how spicy this is going to be, but they seem to be pretty good on their fusion dishes here, so it looks good. Let's get stuck in. And again, where do they get their seafood from? It looks beautifully sourced. The curry sauce very, very light, but I have to say the flavour of the skate is exceptional. And Matanistas, I always have mixed feelings about specials of the day. Sometimes it's what they've got in market fresh, which I think is the case here. But of course, some unscrupulous restaurants put specials on to shift stuff that they can't sell. And I'm not actually sure how they've cooked it because it's got like a charred, smoky taste as if it's been on the grill or the barbecue. I would be surprised if that's the case, but I, I don't know how they've done it. And finally, Matanistas, our final dish from this, shall we say, slightly over-exuberant lunch. Mussels and clams in manzanilla and garlic, sherry and garlic. I've seen them cooked in white wine a lot, very rarely in sherry. Okay, the mussels good. Ah, but the, the clams are the star of the show here. Anyway, one last quick slurp. And I will be back with you, Metanistas, at a rather interesting venue to talk football and, of course, drink some beer. Right, Metanistas, finally we got here, late again, the Goodness Brewing Company Tap Room. Now, they don't supply Manchester, but the owners did tell me if you come down for a Tottenham away game, we're not too far away from the stadium. Well, here I am. It's not particularly close to the stadium, but it's not that far away either, if you see what I mean. Anyway, they do rave about their nitro stout. So, as usual, I'm going to go in, try a few bits of everything, two pints of the stuff I like, probably the stout. Okay, Mutton Easters, as always, when I review brewery tap rooms, I take two at a time, just a, just a little bit to taste, starting with the weakest first. And we're now going for the Small Wonder. So it's a table beer, a pale ale style beer. And if you remember, in Bristol, I was not that keen on a non-alcoholic pale ale from the left-handed giant brewery. So let's hope I have more joy with this one. Of course, I'm not going to judge a brewery on its low or non-alcoholic beer. Yeah, that's quite nice actually. It's quite refreshing. It's obviously a keg ale, so it's slightly effervescent, but it does have a little bit of bite to it. And now moving up a gear to the Yes Session IPA. 4.5% should be quite hoppy because I've been informed that the hops involved are Idaho Mosaic and Citra. And you know if you watch my channel, that is music to my ears. Again, it's a little lighter and less hoppy than I'd expected. I would say this is a good summer session ale, this is. Okay, so the Session IPA was 4.5% ABV. Now on to the Red IPA. Something I don't have very often. In fact, I don't actually see that often. I see very old-fashioned British Red Ales, but not sure what the difference is. Ooh, I tasted a bit of fruit there. So there we are, the red ale coming in at 4.7% with a hint of forest fruit. So I quite like that one actually, a tiny bit of sweetness, but otherwise very pleasant drinking. Now Mutton Easters, about a month ago you would have never seen me having a sour, but now they're cropping up all over the place. And last night at the Ansbach and Hobday tap room, 
I had a fantastic lime and sea salt sour, probably the best I've had. This is mango and passion fruit at 4.5%. It must be a little sweeter because of the fruits involved. Well, surprise, surprise, it actually isn't very sweet, so it's, it's more to my taste. I can't drink sours all evening, but if you're having food, there are quite a good few things that I think would match with this, particularly something like barbecue. Now next, folks, coming in at 5.5%, a hazy pale ale called a Love Supreme. I'm not exactly sure what's in this, whether it's going to be like a West Coast style, whether it's going to be an English style, but we'll see. Some of these I absolutely adore. Some of them are like having a mouthful of treacle. Very light and refreshing, actually. Quite strong. Not as well hot as some that I've tasted previously here. For me, I like them intensely hoppy, so I wouldn't say it's not for me, but it's one for those who like the sort of more balanced, less hoppy brews. Right, Metanistas, onwards and upwards. 5.2% strong R friend Laurel. It's like a single hopped ale, and I believe they sometimes do our friend Idaho and stuff like that when they're doing a different hop to make this single hopped pale ale. I'm not that familiar with the laurel hop, so I'm going to see how it actually tastes. The barman suggested it might be a bit floral. A little sweet, actually, I, I must admit. Athena really loved it. I prefer something less sweet, more hoppy. Okay, Metanistas, on to the Nova IPA, 6.0% ABV, and a cold IPA, I believe, is one where the hops are added first, which is slightly unusual. I'm hoping that I'm going to get a little bit of citrus out of this. Yeah, the tiniest bit, and I, I'm struggling to identify another flavour. It might be, is it ginger? I don't, I'm not quite sure. But having said that, I do actually quite like this one. The aftertaste is quite hoppy. In a lot of these IPAs, what you get up front is the hoppiness. Here, it's in the finish. Okay, and just before I go on to the beer that I've really come here to taste, the No Not The Buttons Vegan Milk Stout. And I'm pleased to tell all of you, because I must have some vegan or gluten affected viewers, is that all of the beers here are gluten free and vegan. Yeah, you can taste the lactose in there. And actually it's got quite a bit of life to it, despite it not being a nitro porter or a nitro stout. You know me folks though, I prefer the nitros and that's what's coming next. And just before I go on to the main event, the Luna Nitro Stout, that one, although there was a lot of lactose in, there was a bit of, well, sort of plum puddingish, if that's an English way of putting it, and a bit of gingerbread and a few other things there. Too sweet for me, but having had a little cheeky preview, I think I'm going to love the Luna. Right, now on to the Lunar Nitro Stout, the stout that the staff and management here have a lot of confidence in and brought me here for. Oh yeah, that is smooth, creamy, milky. I do slightly prefer the London Black with the slight coffee and chocolate notes, more of the coffee notes, but this is good. It's got, actually got a few more chocolate notes than you'd think. Okay, I'm probably having the best possible example in their own tap room, but wow, it's just so smooth and creamy with a dry finish. Okay, it's got a slightly different recipe, but it's not too far off Guinness, actually. And while the best examples in Ireland I'd rather obviously have, when I'm in Britain, if I see this on, I'm probably going to order it. Right, I'm coming to the end of my first pint of the Lunar Nitro Stout. And there are a lot of complex flavours in there. As I've got through the pint, it's developed quite, well, no, a slightly bitter finish, which is not a bad thing. And I'm starting to taste coffee notes as well. 
But having said that, the creaminess has lasted to the bottom of the pint. And I stand by what I said earlier. Okay, I'd rather have a London Black, but I'd rather have this than an average pint of Guinness. The team news is going to come out shortly, and I really think this is time for City to break their duck at the new White Hart Lane. I used to go a bit to the old White Hart Lane, and we had quite a good record, especially in the years of Mancini, Pellegrini and Guardiola. And then when they moved stadium, for some reason, we couldn't score a goal. We haven't scored a goal at the new stadium. We've lost every single match there, and most importantly lost on away goals in the Champions League because of one nil loss there. And one of the features of these matches is people missing sitters hitting the bar or missing penalties or something like that. So let's hope that that changes today. What's often happened is that we've been dispossessed, mugged on the counter and not been able to score. But the chief proponents of that, Harry Kane and Hyung Ming Son, are not going to be playing for Tottenham. Kane has moved on to Bayern and Son is at the Asian Games. So come on City, if we can't break this duck tonight, when can we? Especially with Kevin De Bruyne coming back, red hot form and the team playing well, Rodri importantly playing. So I am going to predict a 3-1 win. I'm going to finish my beer and as I finish it, the team news should be coming out. Right, team news out. I'm still drinking as it's come out. And no surprises at the back, really. Ortega keeps his place. If you remember, Edison got injured at Newcastle, but good to see he's on the bench. In the back four, we have Walker, of course, Gradio, Diaz and Ake. But I think that's probably our best back four. In midfield, Rodri keeps his holding position along with Kovacic. And up front, Oscar Bob gets another game after that sumptuous finish at Newcastle, along with Foden, Alvarez and Bernardo Silva. Some of Tottenham's injury problems seem to be easing. James Madison is on the bench. I think Kulisevsky gets a start for them today. But come on, City. I mean, this is your golden opportunity. We've got a massively strong bench with Kevin De Bruyne and other attacking players on there. So I'm confident I'm going to predict 3-1. Come on, City. It's quite refreshing, though. Okay, folks, get here early if you come here because I've been funneled down some ridiculous route Too away much. from the station. And I didn't believe the steward when I first heard him, but the police confirmed it. And I guess it's something they can do easily for high security games. Well, I'm not sure why this should be one. Well, 27 in and it's the usual story from what I've seen at games at White Hart Lane. City have had most of the ball, haven't created a full-on opportunity, but neither have Tottenham. But they are trying to steal the ball and hit us on the break. Let's hope we don't fall for it and get mugged this time. Well, half-time, Tottenham nil, City nil, not a lot to report. City have had more of the ball, more of the play, haven't found the killer pass to play somebody in. Tottenham threatened to counter a few times, but I think City have defended quite well. Tottenham playing a bit cautiously, trying to spring forward on a turnover and counter-attack. It's probably the shortest half-time review I'm ever going to do. Anyway, the stadium itself is lovely, and I'm looking forward to hopefully having some refreshments.
Okay, no chance of a beer there, ridiculously long queues, one tiny serving hatch. I guess it follows, of course, that the queues for the toilets were pretty small as well. Anyway, let's go and watch the second half and let's not get mugged here and lose 1-0. I've seen way too many games against Tottenham here that have gone like this. I think if we get a replay, we'll be all right. Well, 72 minutes in, still very cagey. Both sides looking a bit blunt, to be honest. Let's hope the introduction of Jeremy Doku and Kevin De Bruyne changes that. Go! Oh. Oh. Oh, well, 81 minutes in, was that our chance? Oh, let's hope we don't get mugged 1-0 again after that. Oh. Well, a corner to our right. Goalkeeper made an absolute hash of that Bakaya. And Nathan Aggie bundled it in. Pretty sure it's going to be VAR. And we all know how lucky Tottenham have been in the past oh, with VAR. Yeah! 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 VAR check over, goal to City. It was a flat, not a foul. 89th minute, come on City, see this home. Well, we finally did it, Mutton Easters. I'm having a pint of classic magnet London porter. Or is it a stout? I think it's a porter. Not only did City manage to score, we managed to win a game at the new Tottenham Stadium and break that massive duck. I had to go to the Weatherspoons near St Pancras, the one near Euston wouldn't let me in. And before I go on to the football, I have to say, getting away from that Tottenham Stadium is not at all easy. There are contradictory signs all over the place. And I ended up having like a half an hour walk to the Seven Sisters 2, where I then had to queue. But it's nearly midnight by the time I'm having my post-match pint.
unfortunately the vlog was incredibly difficult to produce if you say mutton oh you missed this you missed that piece of action it's because i was in a tiny cramped space because there were more people sitting in the row where my assigned seat was than there should have been it happens a lot it is what it is people's mates come down to stand with their mates and of course i couldn't hold the camera properly and I've actually come to the end of a long, short, hard break in London. I'm really tired now after that. Thankfully, the game was pretty poor and there wasn't much to report. Tottenham played very, very defensively. You would have thought Mourinho were the manager, not Foster Coglu. And, of course, they did try and spring some counter-attacks, but I thought we defended quite well. I was quite impressed with Kyle Walker today. I thought he snuffed out a lot of dangerous situations, or not dangerous situations, situations which could have become dangerous. At the other end, not that much going forward for City in the first half, but the second half was completely different. A raft of chances, notably to Jeremy Doku and Kevin De Bruyne, who came on, they both could have scored, and I was sitting there thinking, oh no, Tottenham had done absolutely nothing in this game, they're going to go down the other end, pinch a late goal, and we're going to face another Cockney mugging. Thankfully, it didn't work out like that. The goal was a bit like the game, a bit scruffy. Corner floated over by Kevin De Bruyne. Diaz put pressure on the keeper. And then eventually Nathan Ake poked the ball in. That led to wild scenes in the away end, 9,000 City supporters. And I'm surprised by how many chose to go down. Well, OK, we were probably going to always sell the allocation, but we sold it really quickly. Given it's a Friday evening, and unless you take a supporter's coach, you can't actually get back on the same evening. The trains don't run that late. So, a scrappy 1-0 win to City. I think it was a fair reflection of the actual game. Not the best one I've ever been to, but, you know, these results, they're so important, they all count. And another big team knocked out of the FA Cup. My next game is going to be at home to Burnley, but until then, Mutton Easters, please remember, keep liking, keep sharing, keep subscribing, but most of all, don't forget, you can't beat a bit of mutton.